Generosity and Blessings to Others. When I read that title, for some strange reason, the phrase, pay it forward, came into my mind. Don't know if you're familiar with that. I wasn't until a few years ago. Maybe I have my head too full of trains and football, but I don't think I'd ever heard it until a few years ago when I saw a movie uh, that showed a group of students in America, of course, given the task to create something that might just change the world. One student came up with the idea that if someone does something good for you, then instead of trying to repay that person, you should look to bless someone else. So instead of paying the kindness back, you pay the kindness and the blessing forward. In doing this, hopefully, you could create a ripple effect of blessings throughout the community. So I didn't know a lot about Pay It Forward, so I did a little bit of research this week just to see if it was just an American film, but it wasn't. I was surprised to find that Pay It Forward, the idea goes right back to ancient Greek times. But it seems that actual phrase probably came from an early 20th century novel. What I also didn't know was that there is a global movement for Pay It Forward which started in Australia, and that a day in April is set aside as Pay It Forward Day. So in my ferreting on the internet, I also found out about another initiative that I'd not heard of, and again, probably you have, called Hanging Coffees. And the idea being that when you go and buy a coffee in a shop, you actually pay for one or two more coffees, and you tell the barista that they're hanging coffees. And that means that if somebody goes in and says, I can't afford a coffee, then it's already paid for. Great ideas, these, really. Um, someone is good to you. Instead of paying it back to them, you pay it forward. And I thought about that in a Christian sense. And I thought, as Christians, we don't actually have to wait for somebody to bless us, do we? Because we're blessed in abundance through the gift of Jesus. So paying Jesus, paying generosity, paying blessings forward should be in our DNA. Well, let's have a look at the readings we heard earlier, beginning with Deuteronomy 11, where Moses is speaking to, to a new generation of Israelites. As we know, the old generation did not always cover themselves in glory and behaved quite badly at times. And Moses is trying to start over with this new generation, telling them how to be faithful to God and to the covenant. In the early chapters of the book, Moses talks about the history of the relationship between the Israelites and God, how God's constant grace for the people was always there and how the people were equally, constantly rebellious. So Moses is calling on this new generation, be more faithful to God than your parents were. And as we move through the early chapters, in chapter six, Moses says to them, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul, with all your strength. And these are very familiar words to us, aren't they? But in Judaism, they form a prayer called the Shema, which is used in morning and evening prayer to establish, re-establish on each occasion the commitment to the one Lord God, to obeying the one Lord God and to loving the one Lord God. In these verses, when Moses says to hear, he means much more than just listen. He means listen and respond, or perhaps we might say, listen and obey. The word love in these verses means much more than just an emotion. It means taking a decision, a choice to become devoted to God through soul, and heart and mind. The third part of the Shema 
is that they should worship the one Lord and only the one Lord, our God. Because previous generations had not been good at that. Often better casting golden idols. And the purpose of all that Moses is telling this new generation of Israelites is that if they do the things he's saying, then they can become the nation of priests promised in Exodus. So that's a little bit of background. So as we come to chapter 11 and verse 22, Moses is now explaining what it will be like if they choose to obey and then he challenges them with a very dramatic choice. Verse 22, Moses says, If you carefully observe these commands, to obey, to love, and to be faithful, then God will be with you. And in the next verses, Moses confirms that. God will be with you always, wherever you go, whatever situation, whatever battles, you will be victorious. And I thought it's interesting talking of battles, how the obedient will come through these times because we face battles in our lives, not running on the fields with with swords or anything like that, but all sorts of battles that this world throws at us. And Moses is saying here, if we keep faith and keep trust and obey God, then he will keep faith with us and we will push through those times with his grace. And so we come to the challenge. In the old covenant, Israel had a choice. Obey the law and be blessed. Disobey the law and be cursed. A very binary choice, we'd say in today's language. You're either with us or you're against us. It was up to Israel. If they wanted to be blessed, then they had to show obedience to God as they did in the time of David and Solomon, the great times of Israel. But if they disobeyed, as often they did, they would be cursed. Now thankfully for us, because of Jesus, we have a very different relationship with God. We are blessed, full stop. Not because of anything we do or say or think, but because of our choice to love Jesus. We are blessed. But of course, that doesn't mean we might not sense God's corrective hand if we, uh, if we do what we shouldn't. But we are blessed. The point I'm making, I think, is it because of Jesus and that abundant blessing through God's grace and the gift of Jesus paying it forward being generous offering blessings to others should be as natural to us as breathing so let's move on to 1 Peter chapter 3 this book's written to encourage people to keep faithful irrespective of how the world is treating them. There was a great deal of suffering at this time. Peter's saying if we have faith and we have trust in Jesus, then no matter what we might suffer, we can rightly have hope. Peter had witnessed the way Jesus behaved in the world, how Whatever came his way, he stayed faithful to the values of God. He pushed through injustice and persecution with love and obedience to his Father. And you know, it seems to me that we too are called to face the troubles of the world in that way. I was thinking of an example and and Paul came to mind of somebody doing just what Peter says because he faced significant troubles as we know and yet he still kept faithful. He still preached the gospel 
to his captors and accusers alike, as well as ministering to the various churches. And whilst he was beaten and abused, he was still strong. He was still safe because God was with him. And Peter says in one verse, who is going to arm you if you are eager to do God, do good for God? And I think I understand that now, particularly when I think of what Paul went through. That in a spiritual sense, even though we might be physically broken, as a child of God, we really can't be harmed by this world. But Peter lived in the real world and he had a real world, se world sense and in 14 accepts that we will suffer and it will be hard but he encourages by saying don't be frightened by the threats and the insults that we receive and I think it seems to me this is very timely for us to hear because the society is becoming very different very less faithful in God and very less, less tolerant of the church that it may be hard in times to come in this country it's already been hard for many but we keep the faith and we trust in God Peter urges us to put Christ right at the very centre of our lives and yes be prepared to answer anyone who challenges us. Not with arguments or rebuttals, but with gentleness and respect, telling them about the hope that we have in Jesus. Because if we do this, then we can keep a clear conscience. But those who speak about, against us, those who speak against Jesus, will become ashamed because there will come a time when they have to face up, as we will, to the things we've said and done we don't need to seek revenge in these circumstances leave that to God Romans 12 19 tells us do not take revenge but leave room for God's wrath for it is written it is mine to avenge I will repay says the Lord Peter goes on further and says it's better to suffer for Christ than not. Better to suffer for Christ than doing evil. I do find these things powerful when I sit at my desk and I'm, I find myself sort of sliding down the street sometimes because I don't know if you recognize in your lives what your response is sometimes about being afraid of the world about being afraid of challenges and it struck me this week that if we are afraid and we don't respond with gentleness and honesty then we can't offer blessings and generosity but I know it's not easy without boring you with details and chapter and verse I can honestly think of many times when I've kept quiet, dodging an issue, rather than standing up for Jesus, I've kept quiet for my own sake. Not acting for fear of conflict. Not acting for fear of being excluded by the group of people you're with. Fear of not being able to articulate that answer that we should have to people who challenge Jesus. I don't know whether that is something that you recognize in your own lives. But being afraid of the world stops us being generous and offering blessings. And Peter's saying to us, do not be afraid of the world. But before I beat myself up about the things I've done and maybe we beat ourselves up remember that we are human we are flawed and yes we will 
fail sometimes. But the thing is to try to keep faith at all times. And as that faith grows, so will we better deal with those difficult moments. Stand on God's word. Isaiah chapter 50 verse 9 says, It is the sovereign Lord who helps me. So again, who will condemn me? Just as Peter said, who can harm us? Isaiah says, who will condemn me? Because all of those who challenge will wear out like a garment. The moths will eat them up. So I think Peter is telling us, firstly, we should do what is right in God's sight in the way that we live. Be honest, be respectful, be gentle to others. And secondly, we have the greatest blessing anybody could imagine through the gift of Jesus. And it's this Jesus who tells us in John 13, 34, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. So Jesus, our Savior, commands us, demonstrate love to each other. Not to your friends, not to your family, but to each other. Be generous to all people, to those we meet, and seek to bless them in the, in the meeting we have with them. So if we go back to this idea of paying it forward, then remember what I've already said. We don't have to wait for someone to bless us because we've already been blessed beyond belief and we've so much to give. And the ways in which we can be generous, as we know, are many and extend way beyond giving money. Just some examples. Generosity of kindness, of time, of doing something for somebody, of sorting out a problem, solving an issue, offering friendship, fellowship, and on and on. All of these things are within the gift of each one of us, depending on the situation. Loving one another means just that. And in real terms, that means helping anyone in any way we can. And as we do this, we bless people. But there are, very, some, there are very, some very simple ways we can bless people. Just with a friendly word, a smile, a word of appreciation, by encouraging, by prayer, words of scripture. So many ways that we can offer blessings to people. And I think the question from all of this for me is that are we ready to go out into the world knowing that we're blessed to be a blessing and to pay Jesus forward? Amen.